Okay, everyone. So we are through April and I'm a little bit speechless because it was just an incredible month for me. For the first time in quite a while, it just felt like everything clicked. I made a little bit over $80,000. Uh, this is my best month since April of 2015, I think. Um, May of 2015, I know I'd been off to a really hot start and then my giant PBMD loss happened. So that month was barely profitable. And then ever since then, I mean, the rest of 2015 was just a lot of really choppy months with a lot of big losers knocking my months back. And then 2016 has just been a process of slowly sizing up. Just to take a second to show you something that I find kind of amusing. Take a look at my Profitly chart where I upload all of my trades. I mean, this thing has been pretty much sideways for the last year. Uh, it was doing well up until about May, and then that PBMD loss happened, knocked me back. And over the next few months, I had almost dug out of that PBMD hole and then knocked myself back with CANF again and then took another uh, string of losers at the beginning of October out of frustration. So since then, it's just been a slow climb back. And you can look at this a few ways. I mean, you could say that since uh, my PBMD loss, you know, since the day before that loss, I have not been a profitable trader. I really haven't because I'm not quite past that point yet. Uh, this month brings me really close. I mean, I would hope that May would be a good enough month that I would finally get to new highs on the Profitly chart. But, you know, that's kind of the glass half empty way of looking at it. I mean, you could also look at it and say, okay, since all of my you know sloppy losers in September and October knocked me back again, since I started working on discipline in November, trading small, slowly working my way back up in size, I have six profitable months and I'm up about $185,000. So it's all a matter of perspective. I choose the glass half full perspective where I can call myself a profitable trader since last November, since I started working on my discipline issues. And 185,000, that's not bad for a six month total. So it kind of feels like I'm back and it really feels good to be back. And I don't know if it was just an unusually active month or if I just executed well, maybe some of you can leave me comments in the comment section and let me know what you think about how busy of a month it was compared to what we've seen up to this point this year. But I mean, I'm, I'm thrilled with how this month went for me. I think a big takeaway from this month really can be that it goes to show how important taking a vacation can be when you're just absolutely fried and you need that break. Because end of March, I did slip into some serious sloppiness. That last week, I did bounce back strong. But I was breaking rules left and right in March. But when I got the time off and I went to Iceland, it was a good chance to clear my head. And I always come back strong after vacations because you can get mentally burnt out in this game very easily. Trading, it takes its toll. So when I was away and I was on vacation, I did get that chance to kind of reset mentally. But it also gave me a chance to think a little bit about my trading up to this point, uh, you know, the first three months of the year. And just some mistakes I felt like I'd been making and some other corrections I felt like I could employ. Uh, the biggest one being that I felt like my risk reward was off. I felt like it all year, pretty much ever since November when I first started, I was taking profits way too fast. And I talked about that in the March video, how I was just getting way too caught up in the profit and loss and locking some in just for the sake of having a gain. So I really tried to get back to just trading the chart. And part of doing that was just thinking about how I used to go on crazy rides. I, I used to be able to be patient, but it's a lot easier to be patient when you're down in a position than up. So I was just trying to shift that mentality a little bit. I would get short stocks back in 2014, 2015, where I'd be short at $3, it would go to $5, and then I'd ride it all the way back down to three, three days later. So my new goal was, okay, this time wait till it's more like the backside of the move, maybe get in a little bit late, uh, give yourself a little bit of wiggle room, you know, don't size in too big too fast, and then just try to be patient with it for a couple of days. And that worked wonders for me. I started taking swing positions this month, there were a lot of ones that I took for a couple nights and uh, that patience really paid off. I mean, I had nice wins on SKYS, GBSN, LEI, just to name a few. I mean, UNXL, that was another great swing. So the patience on these shorts, instead of just locking in gains for the sake of it, it gave my winners a chance to run. And I had plenty of big winners this month that far outweighed uh, my largest losers. So between getting mentally back on track, cutting my losses, and then letting my winners run for a change, I mean, that's what made this month possible. And that's the formula I'm gonna to try to stick to going forward. I really only made one mistake this month, and that was with UNXL. Here's what the daily chart looked like on UNXL going into the day where I kind of messed it up. 
It was getting overextended. It had broken out past the 150 area. I mean, I guess the run had started back near one even. So it was extended, but it wasn't super extended yet. And it had a gap down that day. So I like it when, especially on these overextended gap down plays, I like it when the red green mark is the same as the previous day's high of day. It just, you know, it makes it really simple. It's an easy, easy cut point. And so intraday, I was watching UNXL as it was churning and I had gotten short in the high 220s with my risk off of 235. That previous high, that previous green red mark. And it had a little bit of pullback in the morning initially. It was looking kind of iffy. It was consolidating. And then they brought in a big bid in the 220s when it was consolidating, something like a 60,000 share bidder. And when I saw that bidder, I changed my plan. My plan went from cut the loss at 235 to thinking, okay, they're using this big bid to manipulate shorts to cover, to manipulate buyers to come in for the 235 break. I thought that they were going to stuff the move. I thought they were going to get all the shorts to cover a 235 break. All these buyers were going to come in trying to buy the 235 break. And I thought they were just going to sell the house into it, pull the bid, and then that would be it for UNXL. So I changed my plan and I decided that I would go ahead and let it perk through. I wouldn't cover my short and I would give it a chance to stuff. And that if I was wrong, if the move didn't stuff and it turned into a decent spike, I would have to cover first pullback. So the big bid did its job. A few minutes later, it broke through 235 and it turned out it did spike strong. It spiked all the way into the 250s, which was more of a ride than I wanted to go on given my number of shares. But I followed my plan. I took it all off into that first pullback in the 240s. I think I was out at a 243 average. And I avoided going on the ride up to 288. So the reason this went into my loss journal is because it was a $2,400 loss. My max loss was supposed to be $2,000. And I, I went back and forth between what I should call this, a failure to cut loss or playing too large. And I ultimately decided that the mistake here was playing too large because I changed my plan last minute. You know, my plan became to cut the loss into the pullback after giving it a chance to stuff the move. And there's nothing wrong with that. I followed that plan to a T. I did exactly what I was supposed to. I cut the loss in the 240s on the pullback and I avoided the big squeeze. But the problem is it still was too big of a loss. So what I should have done is I should have accounted for the fact that I was gonna have some slippage on my exit, that I wasn't gonna get out around 235 like I had originally planned when I sized in for my risk. I should have covered some up in that consolidation before it broke through 235 just to have my size under control, just to make sure that loss didn't exceed 2,000. But aside from that UNXL hiccup, that was it for me this month. That was the only mistake I made as far as loss cutting is concerned. So a huge step forward from March. I mean, March, I had something like seven or eight mistakes. And the nice thing about it is I didn't use hard stops. I really just can't get that idea to stick with me for some reason. I just hate the idea of putting those hard stops in. I'm just too paranoid about the market makers, I think, being able to see the stop orders and triggering them. So it's just really important that I develop that discipline to cut the losses on my own. And this month, I did a good job of it because even though it was an $80,000 month, I still did have plenty of losers. And I took them off like I was supposed to. I didn't put any huge dents in my month. And that's the reason, or that's part of the reason that the month was as good as it was. No huge losers to knock it back. Before we wrap up here, one last thing I want to share with you guys is this little stat sheet I made for myself in the middle of the month. Because I was curious, going back the last few years, starting in 2014 when I first started trading NASDAQs, I wanted to see how do my winners compare to my losers? Um, you know, my few biggest trades, my few biggest days, best weeks, best months. How do they compare to the worst ones? So I rounded all this data up and put it down, and uh, it's pretty interesting to see some of the results. I mean, you'll notice in 2016, the numbers are a lot smaller so far. Of course, that's because I'm trading smaller size, and we're only a third of the way into the year. But rather than look at this in terms of how does his best trade of this year compare to his best trade of last year or something like that, look at it in terms of ratios. Because what I see in 2014 and 2015 is that my losers far outweigh my gainers. For example, you take my five biggest gains in 2015, if you add them up, it's about $191,000. That barely covers my sole largest loser, PBMD, which was minus $180,000. If you add up my five largest gainers from 2014, it doesn't even cover my largest loser lake. So those ratios are way off. That's not right. And that's what we've been working towards in 2016. I mean, I did size way down just to get those losers under control, just to get my discipline right, just to get my winners bigger than my losers again. And so far through 2016, the ratios are much more like they should be. They're still not perfect, uh, partially because I had that disaster of a loss towards the end of March on CPXX minus $11,000. But even with that being my worst one of the year so far, the ratios are on my side for once. 
So given the way I would let losers run the last couple of years and how much larger my losers were than my gainers, it's kind of a miracle that I was profitable at all. But so far, so good in 2016, and I'm going to keep on updating this as the year goes on. And I'm going to try to avoid falling into the trap where I get into a trade and think, oh, I want it to be one of my five biggest trades of the year. You know, I don't want to start gunning for that and making trading about the profit loss again instead of the individual charts and the setups. I think it'll just kind of take care of itself as I continue to slowly increase the size if I stay disciplined. And especially if I keep doing a good job of cutting my losses, I mean, that's the side of it I should focus on is I don't want to have to add a trade onto one of my top five losers of the year column. So I've got to just stay disciplined. I've got to keep cutting my losers. And hopefully by the end of 2016, I've got some numbers to really be proud of here. I'd love by the end of the year to be able to say for once that my winners stayed bigger than my losers and have that ratio on my side. Because if those numbers stay on my side, if I keep doing my job, it's going to be a really good overall year. So after a month like April, it's kind of hard to pinpoint things that I want to work on or try to improve on because April obviously went pretty darn well. Going into May, I think the first thing that I have to really be mentally aware of is I can't fall into the mindset of, oh, I want to make more than I made in April. I want to beat April's numbers. I'm going to get myself into serious trouble if I start thinking like that. So I really have to keep my focus on the chart, not on the profit loss. Every month is going to have a different amount of opportunity. May could be a really, really slow month like February was. I mean, February before April was the month I was most proud of because I made, I think, only two or three mistakes, and it felt like a really slow month to me, but the profit loss came out pretty decent in the end. So that's what May needs to be like, too. If May turns out to be really slow, well, I want to be able to say at the end of the month that I followed my rules, that I cut my losses, and, you know, if I only make $30,000 or if I only make $5,000, you know what? Like, if I followed my rules, that's okay. So I just can't gun for numbers. I can't try to beat April. That's the biggest thing for me going forward here. But other than that, I'm going to keep on just cutting losses on my own. No hard stops unless for some reason I start really, really struggling with it again. I'm going to keep on trying to have a little bit of a bigger picture view when I'm trading these charts. Stay a little more patient. I'm going to keep doing the swing plays. And I'm going to take a step up in risk. I'm going up to $2,500 max loss now. April was definitely a good enough month that I earned that right. And while, you know, I've got that gung-ho part of me that really wants to take that step up to $3,000 instead, I'm only going to go to $2,500 because I just don't want to push too much too fast. I don't want to do anything to throw myself out of the groove I'm in right now. I want to stay good about cutting losses. So baby steps. I mean, there's no rush. The market will always be here. I really didn't do anything new in April. It was all my textbook setups. It was all the stuff I typically trade. Mostly short selling, but a few longs here and there. So I'm just going to keep on trading my reliable patterns and trusting them to work. But in the cases where they don't work, I've got to keep cutting. So thank you all for watching this video, those of you who made it to the end. I hope all of you had great Aprils as well. I mean, it was a fun month. Uh, let's definitely keep it going into May. I hope that the market stays as active as it has been. And I hope you guys are doing a good job of staying disciplined and following your own rules too. Best of luck this next month.